I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters Business, your source for all things business. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to be a guest on the show, head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have John Peterson on the line, and he is owner and CEO over at Shooty Metals, and he's also founder over at Schwimma. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, John, I'm excited to get into today's topic. So we will talk about what it means to develop your regional workforce and quite a thing that you have done over in Wisconsin uh, with not only Shooty Meadows, but also with Swimma. And we will get into that. But before we do, I want to go a little bit further into your background because uh, I'm from the Midwest, too, and uh, I think we share a lot of similarities. So we, we shared some stories in the beginning about how we both grew up uh, sweeping the shop right? Uh, so uh, let's get into those early days. So tell us a little bit more about how you got started in the business. Sure. So um, I came from a family business that uh, was actually involved in the pre-fam home, home building business. Um, and so at a very young age, um, having um, you know, three uncles and my mother um, being involved in that business. It was uh, a testament to, um, you know, just seeing how family businesses work. Um, and it was intriguing for me as a, as a, as a young man um, and um, really kind of the foundation that kind of got me excited about being part of a, of a family business. So we're, uh, we're recording this right now, uh, mid-November-ish, mid and you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, so I have to think about uh, reflecting on, on my house growing up in a, in a small business uh, owner family and thinking about some of, the, some of the stories that were shared around the table. Anything that comes to mind for you, because I figure like with your, um, between your uncles and your mother and being in a family business, like it was, it's never the average Thanksgiving for, uh, for uh, small business owners. Yeah, you know, we, like a lot of, I'll call it close family and particularly German uh, heritage, um, families, we were really close. And it was not unusual for us, uh, whether it be Christmas or whether it be Fourth of July or whether it be Thanksgiving, to, to get together a, as a complete family. And um, it was, uh, you know, something that was kind of, again, part of that intriguing part of, of that family is while uh, plenty of, 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 of food and, and, and beverages uh, during the event, but, but probably also the, the, the conversations that took place between uh, my uncles um, that sometimes were quite honestly, uh, uh, they got pretty controversial. They got pretty uh, heated at times. And as a, as a, young, a young kid, um, I, I was kind of surprised about that. But what, one of the things that was really amazing to me um, is uh, after the maybe complete disagreements um, is that my, my, uh, my, my uncles would, would grab one another as they're leaving and say, I love you. Um, and, and as a kid, was, that's not really what I was hearing during the, during the, the conversations. <laughs> so it was, it was a really kind of an interesting process to me just to see how um, our family could disagree, but in the end, everybody loved one another. And it was, it was always, it always has been kind of one of my topics that, you know, you could disagree in business, but it's extremely important to show appreciation back to one another. And they certainly did that um, as brothers and sister. No, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I was just thinking about it. Like it's all, there could be some interesting conversations around the, around the table during the holidays for the, it's not, it's just not your typical, uh, your typical interactions. And I just know, I feel like business owners, we just have a little bit something different in us that brings it out. Um, so let's go, I want to go a little bit further. So, so you worked how many, before purchasing the business, uh, how many years were you working actively in the business? Obviously, you're no longer a kid at this point. You, you, were, at the, you were at the company for quite some time before making the acquisition, yes? Yes, and, 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 and actually, I forgot to mention something to you before when we were talking, mm -hmm. is that, you know, my, my earliest years, actually, uh, we had some, we had some uh, farms also that we were involved in. And, uh, you know, as a young kid, we, we picked rocks. I mean, it was, it was kind of like developing your, your, your work ethic uh, as part of that. 
Uh, uh, the other thing that we did, we had a, a house moving business and um, it was always a tradition of us as, uh, as it, when we turned the age 13 that we would work on the house moving business. And I face, say house moving is physically picking up buildings and moving them. Um, and so it was always hard work. And again, that was a pretty much a, a given that as a person growing up in our family that, that you would go through that. Um, another part of our family was, is that again, the metal part of it, I was actively invo involved in that, you know, 12, 13, 14 years uh, old and, and sweeping floors, uh, doing whatever ever it took, uh, painting parts. Um, and, you know, and I remember um, one, of the, one of the stories there was, and again, it's, it's very vivid in my mind is sweeping the floor and driving the forklift out the garage door. But what I didn't realize is that the garage door actually was still partially down and ripping off a, a section of the, of the garage door, which I had to pay for, um, <laughs> which at that time wasn't make, making very much. And so it was a, it was a long, pay, long payment plan, if you will, as part of, but a great learning experience. Wait a minute. So, uh, do they let you? Uh, are you allowed to drive the forklift this day, nowadays or no? <laughs> Just joking. Uh, yes, actually, they will let me. Uh, now, I, I get. I have to make sure that I have my license with me though today. So. <laughs> oh my gosh! What a story. I, I have a similar one. Um, I didn't take the. I didn't take the door down with the forklift. But I remember as a teenager, um, back in you know, my dad, he painted cars. Uh, and I remember I was supposed to move one, and uh, and I remember nicking it and being like, oh, did I just do that? I did just do that. And I remember thinking, maybe he won't notice. And I'm like, yeah, right. It's a beautifully like just painted car. He had to go back into the fender. Oh, my, my heart sinks when I hear that because uh, because I feel it. I, it hurt. And I, I didn't have to pay for it, I guess. So thankfully that I didn't have that kind of payment plan thing because I guess it was just my dad's uh, sweat equity, right? He just, he had to pay for it actually right. because he had to fix it for the client. But right, right. We're on the same page there. Oh my gosh. Uh, so let's go. Uh, let's go a little bit further. So you're um, so you're working now. Obviously, multiple businesses. You're obviously getting older now. You're 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 getting closer to age. How long were you working in the metal business before the uh, the acquisition part? So this is many years before that, yeah. Yeah. So during college, I did a, a fair amount of uh, uh, working uh, during the summers there. Um, you know, going to uh, University of Wisconsin Stout. Um, actually it had a manufacturing engineering concentration and a business degree and uh, so I was applying a lot of that uh, those ideas and concepts during some of the summers um, uh, moving into that and then at that time I wasn't completely sure we're gonna mm -hmm. you know I was gonna be involved with that portion of the business it could have been actually the uh, the metal or the house or the home building business as well because that was really pretty big at the time mm -hmm. um i didn't quite know um during that so so it started mm -hmm. like i said very young 13 but every summer you know we moved around into different portions of the business um a couple of years like i said was at metals a couple of years was at wassail mm -hmm. homes at the same time mm -hmm. so now you're um at some point you made this decision that you're going into the, uh, you're, you will be in the metal business. So at some point there was that, that crucial moment. Um, tell me a little bit more about what that looked like and what kind of took you to say, okay, I'm gonna be in the metal business, the metal side of the business. So in the mid, in the mid seventies, um, uh, my one uncle bought out my other uncles out of um, uh, Wasa Homes and, um, and, uh, and then we actually, as a Peterson family, got a small percentage of ownership of the Shooty Incorporated side, which was the smallest portion of the business. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, that was kind of a deciding factor that we've got some skin in the game already um, and that it made good sense, okay, that I would continue and to take on uh, the smaller portion of the business and see what I could do with it. So I think for some of the people uh, watching this, they think, you know, well, it was his family business. And of course he took it over and maybe like, they, I don't want to give anybody any um, wrong representation here. 
like it's hard to take over any business, let alone a family business. So was your I'll, I'll ask it like this. So so tell me, was it all was it all like fun and games? Was it easy when you did the transition? I mean, tell us a little bit more about that part. No, not not at all. And I, I think one of the things I recognized right away was in with my brother and my dad is, is that, um, you know, <laughs> we didn't own all the shares, right? Mm -hmm. We only owned uh, like, like uh, 40%. And so immediately as a family, we talked about it and it was like, okay, well, you know, if we work hard, we're just going to make it harder for ourselves to buy out the business. And so we just decided right away to go to the bank, right. And, and borrow the, the money to buy out the rest of my uncles as part of that. And, um, you know, it wasn't, it, you know, it wasn't a large business. We had about five people working in the house moving business and about 12 in the metal fabrication business. Um, and so it wasn't a real big business. Um, and the business wasn't at that time, not that very good. I mean, in that 1983 time era, um, you know, energy costs were still high. I, at that point, we, at that, the metal fabrication business was, you know, pretty uh, dependent upon home building, interest rates were still relatively high. And so home building really wasn't doing that well. I mean, we were supplying products to the Wassa homes, right? And there wasn't a lot of business there. Um, and, and, and regionally, our, our economy wasn't that good. So it was a big decision for us to kind of to, to get into this and try to make something happen. I mean, we were building wood stoves and, and, and the wood stoves, honestly, our, our customers uh, really weren't paying us very well. I mean, uh, I mean, I literally had to collect um, uh, as I would make deliveries to these guys. You know, I, it, so it was it was a it was a big big deal for me um, to getting involved in that. Yeah, that is a big deal, and uh, and I, I just had to bring that out because sometimes. Uh, you know, there's some people watching this right now that maybe they, they want to start businesses or they're thinking about it. And I just always have to say, like, I'm guessing at that time, you're probably working, what, 80, 100 hours a week? Yeah, I mean, it, honestly, probably for the first 10 years of, of my business life, you know, being an owner, it was. It was 80 to, 80 to 90 to 100 hours a week. It was not unusual for me to be working on Saturdays and Sundays. And, and trying to understand the business. So, you know, I mean, you, you're involved in managing it on a day-to-day -day basis, but then, you know, then it's a matter of understanding that, you know, what is actually happening? Um, where are you making money? Where aren't you making money? Uh, and, you know, how are we gonna pay the, how are we gonna pay payroll at times? Um, and that's where, again, some of my, my particularly my one uncle, which was kind of like a business father, my uncle Marv, you know, I, I would go to him and talk to him and, and, and be, I, I respected his decisions. He had no ownership in the business, but he would also tell me, he said, you know, it's, you know, getting a sale is just one part of the business. Collecting is the biggest part. You know, you can, you can have all the sales you want. If you're not getting paid for it, it doesn't really do any good. In fact, you're going backwards. And, and that's where he, you know, he encouraged me is to do, do my own collections. I mean, when I deliver the wood stoves, I took the, the straight truck at early in the morning and I made sure I was there early when in fact I knew that their owner or their pay, payables people were going to be there. And I made sure that I got a check for the past dues, okay? And the existing portion of the business that I was delivering just to make sure that I would start catching up on that, kind of clean up the books, if you will, from a cash flow standpoint. You know, again, I, I while it, I would I wouldn't want to do it any other way. It's not easy. Everybody thinks business is easy and it is not. It is extremely difficult, but it's extremely rewarding to see the growth and things that you do as well. Yeah, great way, great way to great way to frame it. Like that growth and when you see things work, it's like magic. And to me, it's like magic. And then but but I like your Uncle Marv, uh, your Uncle Marv's advice, deliver the stove yourself and and make sure you get a check. <laughs> like that that's sage advice. I feel like that's that's old right. practical wisdom. So let's go a little bit further into, um, so now, you know, there, there had to be this pivotal point because, you know, you started with the company was small and we'll get into, you know, present day in a moment, but I want to take you back to maybe that, that point in time where you decided you, you wanted to grow this thing and you were thinking, you know, 
your employees essentially like the risk of of training and having the right type of employee and really investing in that workforce was going to be a make or break factor in your particular business can you take us back to that point to where you had that vision i'm I'm a big uh proponent of uh strategic planning um and creating what I would call your grand vision of where you want to be and kind of creating that, you know, putting that stake out there and saying, you know, in five years, this is what we want to look like. And um, we did that one year and particularly the decision that we made was as we are picking up more and more business from some of our um, OEMs um, that you know, original equipment manufacturers, um, is, is that, you know, we were just making miscellaneous small parts and, 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 and um, it was very difficult. It was very competitive business. And, and we decided one year that we wanted to be uh, known for doing um, medium complex to complex assemblies. And uh, we had done that fairly successfully on a project and we could see that there was a little better margins in it. And, and it also protected us uh, from losing the business through cycles uh, because it, it, it was just difficult for that business to go back in house, right? Um, and when we did that, um, we, we did some looking at ourselves and we said, you know, we think we can grow this business quite substantially. What was our biggest threat? And one of us bigger, biggest threats was people. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can buy all the equipment, new technology, which is extremely expensive. You can put up a building, but if you don't have good quality people, It really is the lifeblood of your organization and you're not going to grow. Um, And so we we made a particular note of that and saying, hey, look, we we need to make sure that we come up with a plan that's a little bit unique to start getting more and more individuals interested in welding and machining and fabrication. And I think the uh, I, I think it's such an interesting like connection that you make in in uh, in manufacturing specifically in welding and like and and your labor. But uh, it's funny because that to me like that goes to to every industry. But I love the way that your approach was uh, that you took to get people involved because it's a little bit unique. So let's go into you know your first step into implementing that plan. Like what did that look like? So we had, um, as, a, um, as a bunch of my associates had gone to a trade show, uh, uh, it's actually the uh, uh, um, show in Las Vegas. Um, and it was all for uh, welding equipment and, and that type of stuff. And when we were going through that, that show, we had seen um, a piece of equipment a welding uh, equipment that actually was uh, a training device and it was doing it in a virtual reality type method. And um, over a few beers, we talked about that and how cool that that was. And we knew that um, young individuals would be pretty interested in, in something like that because it's new technology and virtual reality type concepts. Mm-hmm. So, we said, you know, we, so we kind of cooked it up at that show, at that trade show. And, um, you know, the trade shows actually was called the Fab Tech Show. Um, and um, so we brought that back and we kind of uh, decided that what we were going to do is uh, go into four of our local high schools and, and, and take that uh, welding uh, machine in there. We actually talked to the manufacturer about the idea and the concept. And they, they actually rented it to, to us. Um, so we didn't have to buy it. Um, and um, we went into these uh, four high schools and uh, went into the commons and created um, an opportunity for them to actually try this thing. Wow. And um, at each high school, we actually had somewhere between 100 and 200 kids per school that actually went through the process. And, and then we took the top three kids from the, with the, cause there's a actual uh, score or point system that you get for that. We took the top three kids from each one. Now, mind you, some of them had welded and some of them had never even touched a welding machine prior to that. And um, we brought them back to our facility and actually had them uh, taught them how to weld. 
And, and, and the whole thought process was we bring the parents in so that they can see our facility. They can see that it's not dark and dingy. They can see it's clean. They can see there's robotic welding. They can see there's lasers and, you know, it's a nice facility. Um, so we, it was a way of getting the parents in. And then of course we taught these kids how to weld and, and, um, and then we actually did a, a, a real uh, AWS type welding test to grade that. And we had actually other welding engineers that looked at it and we created an actual uh, banquet dinner uh, where we had the competition. We had suppliers actually provide, if I recall, it was about $6,000 worth of welding equipment. One was actually a welder um, and um, brought students in, parents in, and actually brought in the superintendents from our schools in our area and teachers and instructors and start talking about the demographic problems that we have had in all of the United States and particularly our area and that all these people are going to be retiring and if we don't have uh, people to, to go into those careers, we're going to lose a lot of our business and industry and how important that that was. I, honestly, God, we saw some teachers have tears in their eyes realizing what was happening. And it was very powerful. Uh, when I got, and our group got done with doing that, it was, a, it was really told us that we're just a small piece of the puzzle. We need to make this much bigger than what it is. Um, we needed to get other manufacturers involved in this concept. Um, and we reached out to uh, our local workforce development people and um, um, started running things by them about that whole concept. Um, and they were very, very uh, excited about that because they were also talking about some of the demographic problems. Um, and um, not knowing what we should do, talked to a really large manufacturer in our area and uh, had them all at the table. And uh, can you imagine, this is a union company. And when we started talking about demographics, their eyes got very big because it was a risk to their business as well because th their workforce uh, was much older than ours was as an average yeah. age. And, and they were very, very concerned about that. So they, jet, they automatically jumped on. In a very short period of time, we had probably about 25 manufacturers in the metal industry that were all wanting to help and trying to get this thing going in the right direction. Um, really, really getting some good traction now. And we, we expanded the programs into other areas as well. So it was, it was, it was really, really pretty cool. Wow, what an amazing story! And one of the one of the most inspiring things that I get from your story, and I and I, um and, and in our conversations, even leading up to this, is that you know you could have, you know, looked within. So you could have looked within and just said, "How can I use this program, use this concept to benefit Shooty Metals?" Right? Like you could have done that, but you saw like the bigger ecosystem and the whole approach going back to the idea of, of developing a regional workforce. Like you went, you looked without, you looked at what could be, some people may say, could be competitors for the same jobs, right? This is only a certain amount of bodies to, to work. Um, and, you, and you didn't look inward. You said, you know, no, this is, this will be good for all of us. This will be good for the region, the industry, um, and that it'll have that effect across the board and ultimately great for the students too, who maybe, who maybe didn't know that they don't have to um, leave home. They can stay in their town. They can still learn. They can still um, have a, a prosperous career. They can raise their families there and they don't have to move um, because there's not work. And ultimately, I mean, if you look, you know, like you said, demographic wise, well, if these businesses start closing down because they don't have the right workforce, then obviously over time, that's how, you know, you, you don't have more opportunity around there. So I love that you did that and went outward and you really said, how can you, how can you be a benefit to the whole region? So, John, I think one of the interesting things here is, you know, with regional workforce development, you were working with them and normally they're really more of a reactive organization versus proactive, but you kind of change things with them. I mean, tell us a little bit more about how that how that how that relationship grew. Sure. So as part of the uh, initial stages of us doing our own thing, 
we had gotten workforce development on board with us to start helping us. Um, and they were very, very excited about doing that. Normally, you know, workforce develop, regional workforce development uh, organizations um, will, you know, when a company goes out of business, they'll find jobs for those employees. So, so you know, the word development really is not accurate, right? I, I call it their, their formula um, is, is reactive. And, and so we, we turned them around. I mean, they, they were kind of excited to see what we were doing. Uh, they gave us some pretty good information about um, how many jobs were unfilled in our welding trades. Um, and um, when we started looking at that, it was, it was a large amount, if I'm not mistaken, at that time, there was like 2,000 welding jobs unfilled in our wow. area. And, you know, and that's stopping us from, from succeeding, right? And so uh, workforce development was an instrumental part. And so we kind of changed their model. Their board was excited about making that change. Um, and uh, the long story short is, is that that actually then became um, uh, where they got other manufacturers involved. Uh, one a good example is a very large uh, um, OEM uh, or, or large manufacturing company in our area, which employed probably around 1,500 employees. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to bring them into uh, a meeting with us and workforce development was there. And we started talking about the demographic problems that we had. And because of their uh, aging employees in a, in a union type environment, um, they were gonna get hit first. And, mm -hmm. and when they heard about the, the, the demographic problem and the number of welding jobs that actually were out there, they're like, we're all in, what can we do to help? And, you know, always having the biggest employer in the area makes, makes you know, it, things work much better, right? And, and, and got, it got other companies more involved in this as well. We could see that the infrastructure, again, working with workforce development really wasn't there. The technical college um, had good equipment, but not really as good as we would hope. We actually went to Miller Electric a Wisconsin-based company, they were actually uh, able to help us in bringing some brand new equipment into the facility. Again, uh, making sure they had the best tools available. Um, uh, the technical college uh, expanded their program, uh, upgraded their program, added um, a laser and some press brakes, things that we didn't expect. Um, and uh, so it, it really, really made a big difference for us to get workforce development on board. Wow, that's a, that's a big deal. And I, I like how this just started with uh, this. If, if I if, this just started with you being at a trade show and see, well, obviously it started with your strategic plan before that, right? So you put in work, but you're at a trade show, you get this idea because you see this virtual reality simulation and you're like, oh, for well, then we could do this for welding. This, this is going to be pretty cool. Take it into the schools. And then it grew. And here you are now um, working with workforce development and the largest employer in your region or in that area and uh, and bringing together this coalition, if you will, <laughs> under Schwimma um, to really develop that whole region. I just think, I mean, I just think it's an amazing, inspiring story how all this took place. So now we had really a, an understanding of the capacity at the technical colleges, but we didn't necessarily have the enrollment that we were hoping for. Uh, so again, as a, as a group, it's not just me, it's all the other manufacturers are getting together and are saying, you know, we need to, we need to uh, do uh, uh, more to get kids interested. And that really was um, the heavy metal tour. Um, and it's a branded name that we used. And um, the bottom line is, is, it, is that that very first year we had about 200 kids from the middle schools who went through manufacturing. Manufacturing normally doesn't do a great job of showing, you know, what's inside their facility. And so that started, um, and um, then we brought them to the technical college and we showed them the, the potential jobs that are available out there. Um, and so that, you know, every, a lot of parents and a lot of teachers had, had basically said, you know, kids should go on to college. Some of them had no business going on to college, not because they weren't bright individuals, they just didn't know what they wanted to do. And so the bottom line is we showed these individuals what jobs that are out there and that, 
it's a different way of getting where you need to go. It doesn't have to be where you end up as a welder. It, it, you start there and you could end up being a manufacturing engineer or a project manager. And, and businesses like ourselves, small business, are more than willing to help pay for some of these individuals' college as they are working as part of that. So we started showing those opportunities and it became a different pathway. And some parents actually were very happy to see that. Um, so, um, you know, that, that started out, uh, I think it was, like I said, 10 high schools. And I, I think we're up to like 30 or 40 high schools now. Mm -hmm. And this last year, we had 5,200 middle mm -hmm. school kids going through manufacturing in one day. And now not just going through the one technical college, but going through three technical colleges and seeing what's available as well. And so now we're seeing the grassroots of this working where actually the enrollment into both um, machine tool and welding has increased and is moving forward. Um, and along that lines, what we also saw was the high schools started realizing that their programs weren't as good as they should be. And that I think the, the statistic is something like 98% of the kids that go on to a technical college degree stay in the area. Um, and, and, and I believe it's, it's, it's a lot less. I think it's, it's like 65% of the kids go to college. They, they stay, they don't go to come back to the area. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very large number. So the bottom line is that they realize that for the benefit of our own tax base, that we should be looking at different alternatives. And so uh, uh, the, the Wassa School District did a, a very substantial expansion um, into the into having more shop classes. Um, uh, Stevens Point here recently just did uh, also a big program in now DC Everest. So all of our local regional areas have done a big expansion. Um, and so so again, it's just been kind of cool to see how businesses who work together to develop and solve a problem we did it and we did it really without any what i would call governmental help mm -hmm. wow that it, it's an absolutely amazing story and one of the things that i love about this is that you're you're almost swinging, not to get too political here, but you're you're swinging the pendulum back a little bit because our I feel like our our parents and our and our um, you know and also the students that are coming up have been almost brainwashed into this idea of of what college means or what it's supposed to be. Now maybe a generation ago or a certain amount of time ago that was possibly correct. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But what people have to understand is that that's all marketing towards you too. Like most of my friends, and maybe it's just when I graduated, I don't know, but um, they weren't, when they graduated making that, like that, that lower end entry level salary that they were, so, that they were sold on because they now have their piece of paper in college education and it took them 10, 15 years to pay that debt. And then they're just finally starting to make money. I mean, that's, that's 10 years of their life already. There, there always was a whole nother route there to where you could, you know, you could go to school, you could get your training, you could do all these things while you're working and making money. So meaning you don't have to take on all that additional debt or all these other things like, and not trying to make this an argument pro or not against, uh, against college or anything like that. Cause that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I love that you're swinging the pendulum. So people have a choice before this, before this, I would argue that maybe people didn't even feel they had a choice in the area because they're thinking, well, if I don't go to college, there's something wrong with me or I have to do that because that's what my parents want or this or that when it, it's not even their dream. So now they get to college and they're like, well, I don't know what I want to do. Like, that's the biggest thing ever. Like, I was fortunate to, to know what I wanted to do when I went to college, but a lot of my friends didn't figure it out to that third or fourth year. And after they changed like three or four majors. So why did they have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to figure that out when they could have done something completely different and made tens of thousands of dollars and not just paid interest on debt and paid, you know, the colleges and switch classes and this and that. Like the idea that a kid is going to be 18 years old and choose their their path immediately is ridiculous. Like they're going to choose their path immediately and be and say, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to be a lawyer at 18. You know, if you want to be a lawyer, it's not possible. So now you have this, you have this whole other like world that's open to them. 
and they don't have to necessarily leave home. They can stay around their families. They can, you know, live in the same communities that they were raised in. And this might be my, my Midwest talking. I'm in, the, I'm in Los Angeles now, but I'm like, man, if I would have made possibly gone some other routes, maybe I wouldn't have left. I don't know. Um, but there's just options now. And that's what I love about Swimma. So that's, that's my take on the story. And I'd be interested to hear from you, John, if um, now you, this, this program has been in effect for quite some time. Is there, um, is there somebody that's been through like the program that maybe went and started on the, on the heavy metal tour and then kind of worked their way up and now they're working or give us a feel for the, what's happened with some of the students maybe. So we, at one of the, uh, um, competitions in, in the uh, welding area. We had a, a young gal and her name is Casey. Um, she probably weighs about 85 pounds. <laughs> um, she, she really cute little gal. Um, she had gone through um, the whole program. She had gone through middle school. So she was exposed to different opportunities. She originally wanted to be a nurse mm. and um you know, she, uh, she, when she got into high school, uh, she did the virtual reality welding machine. Um, and she found out that her skill is, is that, and again, she's never, she's never welded before. Uh, her skill was better than any guys. She took number one um, in her competition at her high school. Um, and then um, we, we uh, brought her actually into our business and, and, and had her do the testing here. Um, and then she went on to actually take completely first prize. Uh, and now mind you, these are guys that have been and, ga and gals that, in, that have been going through shop classes, right? And, and they've been practicing this process for a long time and she blows them away. She just does an aw absolutely awesome job. Um, and, you know, I had obviously, you know, one of the benefits of being part of this is, is to have an opportunity to talk to the parent, all right, or parents in this case, which I did and, and, um, and told him and, 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 and his, and the mother as well as this is not the end, this is the beginning, you know, and we'd love to have Casey come to work for us. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it all goes. She came in uh, actually right out of high school. She didn't even go on to the technical college and, um, um, in the beginning, um, and we, she actually enjoyed it, loved it. Um, she's actually been a, a speaker for us at our golf outing, um, and you know there she is, this young gal, cute as hell, and and uh, um, is, is, is one of our best robotic welders now. Um, and as part of that, never would have happened if we wouldn't have done what we did. Right? This shows that it does change people's behaviors to think about things and. She's very passionate about welding. She wants to go on. Now she has gone back to the technical college, so and we're paying for that. Um, so she's getting her uh, her uh, two year uh, associate degree. Uh, we'd love to continue this pathway. I, I think it's uh, you know who knows where it's going to go. Uh, uh, hopefully someday she's a manufacturing engineer or or something along that. Because again, she's learned the trades hands on. Uh, and then she does go on to a, to a four-year type degree. She'll have that base foundation. At times we struggle with when we bring in somebody who has only a four-year degree that doesn't have the technical skills that she will have, right? So, so yeah, it's been, a, and we've got more than those, more than hers, a success, success stories like that, which is just really, really cool. And it's rewarding for a business owner to see that happen, right? Um, and to, 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 to see that actually physically take place where somebody is really excited about the career path that they've taken. Man, what an amazing story, John, and what a great work that you're doing over there and all, and all the manufacturers that have, have joined forces for SWIMA to really help that regional workforce develop. I mean, it's got, it's got me feeling all warm and fuzzy inside. I'm like, oh, John, this is a great story, man. Uh, like just to see that. And, and I'm picturing this, this uh, petite woman, I believe you said she's all of 80, 90 pounds, whatever. And I'm, uh, she's the one that she's the best welder out there. And she's, she's over here kicking the butts of the guys. I mean, that's a fun story. It is. It is. So, you know, our, our program, um, 
Atom is one that we're actually now trying to expand into all manufacturing in our regional area. Um, our fundraising um, is uh, primarily based upon um, a golf outing, which we raise. Uh, well, we didn't have it with COVID, but the year before we raised about $70,000, which, you know, we're a nonprofit. So all that money goes back into tuitions and in other programs that we have. Um, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, we also are going to have an expo coming up this year, trying to bring some speakers in to raise some more money. We, we actually like to do some extreme makeovers in some of the uh, local rural type high schools again, trying to build that pipeline, right? And to try to get more programs. We have another program that we just kicked off uh, not too long ago where um, it's for um, people in retail. We all know retail's kind of going backwards a little bit with the Amazons and things. And so we're trying to track some of those individuals by going online and just starting to improve their skills. And then we offer them an opportunity to um, uh, take on additional classes um, at a very small amount and we guarantee them a job interview in, in one of the manufacturing companies that are participating as part of this process to get again more and more people interested in manufacturing. For every one manufacturing job it is typically supports six non-manufacturing jobs um, and you know a part of our economic development strategy in our area is that Wow, that's an amazing stat right there. Um, so John, that being said, if somebody's watching this and they want to learn more about either Shooty Metals or if they want to learn more about SWIMA and how to get involved there, I mean, what's the best way for them to do that? So from a, from a, a SWIMA standpoint, it's uh, CWIMMA.com. And from a Shooty Metals, it's SCH. U uh, e t t e m e t a l s dot com. Um, you can you can find uh, our number online. I'll even throw it out there: seven one five three five five four five zero zero. Leave a message. I'll get back to you. Fantastic. Well, John, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on this show. I'm, I'm just so excited to share the story of uh, Shooty Metals, of course, and then also Swimma and what you're doing there and the other manufacturers are doing there to promote your region and to really, you know, create opportunities for young people that maybe wouldn't have been there otherwise. So without you and the other visionaries coming together to really pull together and change things in your area. I mean, I, I love it. This is exactly the type of story I love to bring my audience. So again, thank you for sharing that with us and to everybody um, watching if you're tuning in for the first time don't forget hit that subscribe button definitely love for you to be a return viewer or listener if you're listening to this on the podcast um, but definitely do that and if you're watching this on the youtube channel leave us some comments in the video love to know what kind of projects and other things that you have going on and that you're working on and uh, john thanks again for coming on the show it's been awesome